Robert Louis Stevenson was a novelist who grew up in the 19th century. In those days, street lights just did not come automatically. The government in Scotland had allowed people with employment to go take the ladder, light up every street light, and then come down. As this Robert Louis Stevenson, young boy, was looking at dusk one evening, and he saw this linesman putting the ladder, climbing up every post, lighting up the uh, lamp over there, closing the glass lid, and coming down. He turned to his father and he said, look, they are punching hole in the darkness. Look, they are punching hole in the darkness. Well, that is true of our Lord Jesus Christ. The light of God has punched a great hole in the darkness of the world through Jesus Christ. Through his life, death and resurrection. Dear friends, we live in a dark and an evil world. And Jesus expects his followers, the church, to be the light in a dark world. Well, I have titled today's message, Light in a Dark World. Open your Bibles with me, if you can, to 1 Samuel chapter 3. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, Samuel becomes the light of God in a dark world of his. And today, we are going to see how we can become that light in a dark world. The theme of 1 Samuel chapter 3 is that the Lord chooses a prophet. Come with me to chapter 3 and this verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Remember, Hannah uh, was a woman who by prayer and by surrendering, she received a promised child and Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we can find that Hannah went back to the temple with Samuel and Samuel was ministering before the Lord under Eli. In sharp contrast to Eli's sons and all the evil and the wickedness that they were doing. So boy Samuel was one says ministered before the Lord under Eli and in those days the word of the Lord was rare and there were not many visions. Visions were infrequent uh, and the word of the Lord was rare. Does not mean that God was not speaking. God was constantly speaking to his people but the hearts of the people had become calloused it had become walls of great height where God's words could not penetrate into the hearts of the people. The problem was not with God nor the word of God. It was not that God was silent. The problem was that God's voice was not heard. It was not breaking through. There was resistance to the word of God to come to the people. There was resistance like an iron wall in people's ears. It was difficult those days for God to be seen and it was difficult for God to be heard. It is not surprising given what was happening with Eli and his sons in the temple or in the tabernacle why God's words could not be heard. In this chapter, we will find a great change from what happened in chapter 2. The Lord is choosing Samuel and Samuel instead of Eli will be the prophetic instrument of God from now. Why? What was wrong in those days? Remember, the era was best described in Judges chapter 21 verse 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they did. This tells us what the problem was. The cause of resistance of God's words coming to people primarily was faulty leaders of Israel, faulty priests and faulty tribal leaders. At least three times in 1 Samuel chapter 2, the chapter before, we find the sharp contrast of a godly leader and an ungodly leader. Sharp contrast of a good leader and an ugly leader. What makes the difference between a good man of God and a bad man of God? Come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. We can find the contrast given by the writer of 1 Samuel. 
look at the contrast the boy ministered before the lord under eli the priest here is a good leader in the making and look at the ugly leader and the bad leader was 12 eli's sons were scoundrels and they had no regard for the lord contrast of a good leader and a bad leader for samuel chapter 2 verse 17 and 18 the sin of the young men was very great in the lord's sight for they were treating the lord's offering with contempt bad leader the very next verse gives us the contrast of a good leader but samuel was ministering before the lord a boy wearing a linen ephod come to first samuel chapter 2 verse 25 and 26 his sons however did not listen to their father's rebuke for it was the lord's will to put them to death contrast it with a good leader you see how the writer is wanting us to understand what was wrong with his royal what was wrong with its leaders and how a new leader is in the making the very next verse and the boy samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the lord and with the people the priests the nation's leaders were really bad they were abusing the sacrificial system they were stealing the offerings from the temple and even committing sexual immorality right within the gates of the temple first samuel chapter 2 verse 22 talks about it now eli who was very old heard about everything his sons were doing to all israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting ongoing deeds of unrepentance and sexual immorality gross immorality rebellion against yahweh and see the consequences to the people who were facing that the word of god was not heard but what is the consequence directly to eli's house for samuel chapter 3 verse 13 for i told him that i would judge his family ongoing immorality ongoing hatred and working against god god is sitting on the judge's seat now i would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about his sons blaspheme god and he failed to restrain them the real meaning over there in hebrew is that his sons cursed god and this father kept quiet looking at the sons cursing god we may not see eli's sons cursing god by their verbal uh, display of words but by their deeds what they did was detestable to god right in the presence of god and by their deeds they were cursing god and in verse 14 it says therefore i swore to the house of eli already it has been swore by a man of god in chapter 2 the guilt of eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering So Eli was a leader who would not correct his sons a father who is not fulfilling his godly duties a father who allowed his children to blaspheme god so what is the consequence god will judge his family god will not accept their sacrifices and offerings and god will not hear them therefore no word of god was not only heard in his house but the whole of the land of israel God says you insisted on scorning my sacrifice and my offering I will not be available to you even if you seek reconciliation with God even if you come up with a sacrifice and offering I will not accept your offering Eli and his sons so what do we see over here God's light is not penetrating through even to a nation called by God and brought to the promised land that is primarily because of faulty leaders and first of all that what we see over here in this passage is leaders write down leaders who do not see leaders is who do not see the light of god well we are living in a world uh, where we have seen some good leaders and some bad leaders good leaders who have led their countries and their states to prosperity but bad leaders who have led the people from darkness even to utter darkness and to evil polit we have seen bad leaders in the companies around us who get into the helm or who get into the top 
position of the office and misuse the leadership, misuse the power. The, like the bad leader, one example is the founder of Satyam, Ramalinga Raju. You know the story about him. And there are many other CEOs who are in the top position, but bad leaders as example for us. And then we have examples of bad political leaders like Stalin or Hitler, Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein and so on. Perhaps we even have bad leaders in our own country, in our own political systems. Leaders who ought to be ruling in justice and righteousness and giving the light to the people of God or people in that country, but taking the people in the just opposite direction in the name of many other things, not giving justice. Then, sadly, we have also seen bad leaders throughout church history. You wonder when you see even leadership in the church getting corrupt if there is any hope like Eli. Right in the tabernacle of God, there was a corrupt leader and the people of Israel were, would be wondering, is there any hope for the people? Because the corruption and bad leadership has not only in the corporates outside, but it has come and transferred into the house of God. And we wonder, is there any hope? The fact of the matter is that God is in the process of selecting his leader. Uh, who will be the instrument of light in his generation in the place where God has put him. What is true for leaders can be true for each and every one of us. Don't tell that I'm not a leader, I'm not a boss somewhere. But we are all able to be falling like these leaders in our own lives. What is true for leaders is true for all of us. If we do not seek after God, we too will not see God. We too will not hear from God and our generation will not hear from God. You don't seek God, you don't find him. You don't find him, you don't see him, and you don't hear from God. Even though God is over here, just in the presence of God, in the Ark of the Covenant, he's waiting to commune and communicate with his people because of the faulty leaders and the faulty system. His word was not coming through. God was right there in the Ark of the Covenant. God was right there in the sacrificial systems and in the offerings. But they could not recognize God and they failed to recognize God. <clears throat> Charlie Chaplin was one of the top actors of the far gone era and every child wanted to imitate Charlie Chaplin. Even the life of Charlie Chaplin around the world, there used to be fashion shows in the costume of Charlie Chaplin around the world. It became a fashion. All the pictures and all the character that he displayed in the movies, people would put on and have a Charlie Chaplin look-alike show. One day that show came to his own town in San Francisco. Charlie Chaplin decided, I want to participate in a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest. He dressed up like Charlie Chaplin, one of his uh, characters in his movie, what he has done, and he went and enrolled himself. And the sad part is, the real Charlie Chaplin did not even make to the finals. He was right over there and everybody was trying to become this Charlie Chaplin. But nobody realized that the real Charlie Chaplin is over there and he did not even come to the finals. Many times we are like that in the presence of God. God is right next to us in our day-to-day -day life. When we go to the office, when we are at home, God is whispering to us. God is speaking to us. But many times when the real God who wants to communicate to us with various situations in our life is constantly coming to us, we are far too busy to recognize the voice of God. We are far too corrupt and we are far too in the world to recognize and hear the word of God, which is a real word of, of light in this dark world. Amen? God is willing to reveal himself and he is there if only we seek him. If only we see. If only we recognize God. He does not force himself on any one of us. If we don't seek him, we will not see him. Just like those bad leaders in 1 Samuel chapter 3. So how are we to see God? How are we to seek him? Let us find out from a very simple narrative in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. One night, Eli, 
whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now listen to this, as this passage is over there, I want you to understand that the Old Testament narratives, the way the writer has put it, in the setting there is a lot of meaning. And if we just put that setting and think and reflect on that, we will get what the writer is telling. Not only for this case, you put any narrative of the Old Testament, it is all literary marvels. And if you just go back and just see what is happening over there, you will find a more than what you just meets the eye in that text. Look at the setting over there. Come to 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 2. One night... So it is talking about a situation where it is utter darkness everywhere. There is darkness around the land of Israel because obviously the sun had set, it is night. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak. Now Eli's eyes has lost the light. Look at the contrast of light and darkness that the writer wants you to understand when we read that. Eli, it's darkness all around. And Eli's eyes are becoming dark. He's not able to see. Whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see. So there is darkness in his eyes. Was lying down in his usual place. Look at the place where Eli is so that he's not hearing from God. What is surrounding him? Darkness. The writer wants us to understand. His eyes were dim. And he is lying in his usual place. There's nothing unusual for him to see God. He's just in a very ordinary place where he cannot hear from God because darkness is all around. And look at the sharp contrast with verse 3. Verse 3 says, The lamp of God had not yet gone out. In the tabernacle or in the tent of meeting, there used to be the lamp of God that used to be lit the whole night until morning. So it was somewhere in the night when there is darkness all around, there is a glimmer of hope. The dark leaders are sleeping, their eyes cannot see. But in the midst of that, there is a glimmer of hope. Where? In the tabernacle, in the presence of God, in the dark world, there is a glimmer of hope over there. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out. And where was little Sammy boy? Where was he there during that time? Where was Eli? And where is Sammy boy? Look at the exchange of leaders that is happening. Look at how God is extinguishing the flame of a tall leader called Eli and his sons. And God lighting up the flame of a young lad called Samuel. Look at that verse. The lamp of God had not gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Look at the contrast. Samuel was in the place of the light. The narrator wants us to understand there is something happening over here. If you really want to see God, you need to be near his presence. The presence of God dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant. It does not mean that Samuel was lying alongside the Ark or somewhere over there because nobody can go there. And there is a lamp over there, but he could go as close as possible where priests could go. And he was spending time in the presence of God. Darkness is all around him. His dark leader who does not hear from God for a long time. He is sleeping. His eyes are weak. He cannot see. But here is a young lad Samuel who could go as close as possible to the very light of God. And he was waiting to hear from God. God is willing to reveal himself to us. Not to Eli and his sons, but people like Samuel who goes so close to the presence of God, who wants to hear from God, who wants to see God. God seek and he will reveal himself to people who are willing to seek him. We can see God if we seek the presence of God. That's a hint that the writer wants us to understand. You will not find God in the darkness of the world around there. You may be a child of God. You may be a minister of God. But if you want to hear from God and seek God, you need to take that step to come close to the presence of God. And you will find him and you will hear his voice. Moving forward, 
the fate of Eli and the fate of Samuel are crossing. The great high priest is coming down and the young lad is rising up. The fate of Eli is being extinguished. The light and the lamp of Eli is being extinguished while another one is being kindled over here. Let me ask you, my dear friends, how is your lamp this morning? Is it burning? Is it extinguished? Or it is kindling like young Samuel, thirsty to know God, get thirsty to get near the presence of God. And God specializes in using such people. Why was Samuel chosen? Because he longed to be in the presence of God. He was near the presence of God. And what happens when you come near the presence of God? Your ears will hear the voice of the Lord. Come down to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Then the Lord called Samuel, not Eli. Why? Because he had taken some concrete steps to be awake and alert, to discern the voice of God, to be in the presence of God. And he heard the voice of God. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you call me. Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. The only authority Samuel was subjected to until now is his master, Eli. And now in this passage, we understand a great change that is happening. Eli is coming down. Until now, Samuel's master was Eli. By the time this encounter with God is over, Samuel's master will become the Lord Almighty. And there is a change of master that is happening in Samuel's life unknowingly. He is going to Eli because he is subjecting himself to his master. Finally, he comes to the real master of his soul, the Lord himself. Come down to chapter 3 verse 6. And again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You call me, my son. Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. What time is it? It is the middle of the night. Samuel is hearing the voice of God. He's near the presence of God. And the moment he, until now, his master was Eli. And even in the night, when he thought it was Eli speaking, he is running first time, second time. Third time back to Eli because he was a one who surrendered himself to his master. He was teachable. He was willing to learn. He was willing to dedicate his life and take his path in the direction of God. That's why three times he goes back. Who is a fool after telling in the middle of the night to disturb Eli? And he already told that it is not he who has called him. But look at the teachable heart, the willing heart, the surrendering heart to his then known master Eli until now. And the fourth time Eli directed him to God. Come with me once again to one more observation over here. Uh, that is chapter 3 and is verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of God had not been revealed to him. Where is Samuel sleeping? Next to the Ark of the Covenant. Somewhere in the tabernacle, outside the presence of God. Whose word is he hearing? God's word. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, Samuel yet did not know the Lord. There is a comparison between Samuel not knowing the Lord and Eli's sons not knowing the Lord. His sons, the chapter 1 and 2 says that Eli's sons were wicked and they never knew the Lord. And here is a man dedicated from childhood coming close to the presence of God. And the Bible says, he also yet did not know the Lord. But there is a difference on how Eli's son did not know the Lord and how Samuel yet did not know the Lord. Eli's son refused to listen to God. Samuel simply did not know how to listen to the Lord. Can you see the difference? Both are godly people. But one group of children said, I refuse to listen to God. I refuse to listen to godly advice. But Samuel, young Samuel, he did not know how to listen to the Lord. Sons of Eli rejected and refused to accept God. Samuel still did not know how to seek the Lord. He's still waiting. He's still journeying in that process. 
Eli's sons were irresponsible. Samuel was ignorant of God's call and God's voice. Eli's sons were rebellious. Samuel was raw in the presence of God. He had no prior experience of hearing from God. Now listen to that three, chapter 3 and this verse 7. Once again, let's read that. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. Where is Samuel, by the way? I want you to imagine with me. Where is Samuel? Dedicated by his mother, living in the presence of God, living with Eli, and very clearly chapter 2 and chapter 3, verse 1, three times says again and again, Samuel was ministering before the Lord. But in chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible points to us that he still did not know the Lord. He is living in the temple, but not knowing the Lord. I'm making a point over here. Dear friends, let me ask you. Do you really know the Lord? I come to church. I give my tithes. I pray in the morning. I do all my Christian duties. Samuel was doing that. More than that. But did Samuel know the Lord until now? Not yet. Many of us think that Christian duties will automatically reveal to us and make known the great God to us. Whereas the real fact is, many of us are still in the dark and has not known the Lord the way we should be known. <clears throat> Let me tell you, dear friends, young generation, second and third generation Pentecostals, if your parents know the Lord, it does not mean that you children know the Lord. It's not enough to have your parents' prayer. It's not enough to have your parents' faith. Your father may be the greatest pastor or the great man of God. That doesn't mean that you know the Lord. The question is, do you know the Lord? Samuel, you're in God's presence, but you still don't know me. Ruth Graham wrote about her five children when her husband, Billy Graham, was a world-known evangelist, conducting crusades all around the world, a lot of crusades. But when she looked deep into her house, two out of five children were not in the Lord. And she was pained with her husband, Billy Graham. We are trying to reach the world, but right within our home, there are children who still do not know the Lord. And dear parents, there may be parents listening to me right now. Hearts are heavy because you know the Lord, you live for the Lord, you serve the Lord, but still you have not seen your children knowing the Lord. And you're seeing right in front of your eyes, they're going in various ways. They both began to pray for those two children who were doubting the existence of God, who ran away from the knowledge and understanding of God and Christianity meant nothing for them. Coming to church meant nothing for them. And God in his time visited them. Amen? Second generation Christians, third generation believers sitting at City Harvest and watching me online. Let me tell you that knowing the Lord is a personal journey because our father knew the Lord doesn't mean that I know the Lord. And we need to strive like Samuel to know the Lord. Moving forward in the same thought, sleeping next to the ark does not mean that you can know the Lord. A car just put in a garage does not mean that the car will run fine. Work has to be done. Samuel was sleeping next to the ark, but he still never knew the Lord. You may be brought up in a Christian home, a Christian school, a convinced education, or a good Christian education. You may be surrounded in a Christian environment, maybe working in a Christian company does not mean that you know the Lord and I know the Lord. It is a personal choice that we make. It's not based on our surroundings. It is a one-on-one -on -one walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Sleeping next to the ark of the Lord does not mean that we know the Lord. That was the case for Samuel. And thirdly, what was Samuel doing? First Samuel chapter 2 verse 11, the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Chapter 2, verse 18. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. 
chapter 3 verse 1 the boy samuel ministered before the lord under eli and chapter 3 and this verse 7 the next verse says he never knew the lord he was ministering in the temple but still never knew the lord ministering before the lord does not mean that we always know the lord i can preach I can sing. I can do many things before the Lord and before people. Does not mean that I really know my God. And there is a heart transformation that has happened in my life. And that's why Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do this in your name? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Samuel yet did not know the Lord. My question to you and I is that, do you really know the Lord? Does Pastor Shine really know the Lord? That's the question you and I need to answer. Let me tell you, dear friends, our God is a holy God. And if we are not morally upright, that tells me that I do not know the Lord. If I'm still battling with adultery and secret sins that nobody knows, that says that I really do not know. I'm doing many things. I know a lot of things about the word of God, but I still do not know the Lord. Because if the Lord comes and takes over our life, it is an overall transformation. He becomes the Lord of our life. So if I'm still morally not right, I do not know him. If I'm not doing what the Lord commands to do, I do not know him. First John chapter 2 verse 4. Whoever says I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. If I do not love, John says, I do not know God. First John chapter 4 verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Is it not a sad reality that people are flocking churches? People are doing many things in the name of the Lord. But hardly anybody truly personally knows the Lord and has an encounter with the Lord. That should be different of each and every one of us. While we practice Christianity and our faith publicly, internally, every one of us should know the Lord personally and walk with the Lord. Let's move forward. First Samuel chapter 2 verse 26. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. This is a statement before knowing the Lord. In other words, in people's eyes, in the narrator's eyes, there is growth in Samuel. There is goodness in Samuel. The favor word in Hebrew is goodness. That means he's growing in likeness of God. There is goodness in him. People are approving him. But still chapter 3 says, he still did not know the Lord. You may be progressing in the eyes of people. You and I may be doing a lot of things in the eyes of people. But you and I know how is my commitment with Jesus and whether we are really growing in the Lord or not. Moving forward to the next theme. Not seeking God, not recognizing Him, and ignoring God is a disaster. It is catastrophic. It is a disaster. We may be coming to church, we may be doing a lot of things, but deep within, if I do not seek God, and how do you really see God? You see God in the word of God. This is the truth of God. And if I do not have a habit of daily meditating on the word of God and seeking the word of God for my day-to-day -day survival and day-to-day -day growth, I really do not know the Lord and such life is a disastrous life. Why? Because the manual for good life and a purposeful life is given in God's word towards us. This is the primary way where we know the Lord. This is the way where we can know the spirit of God and the will of God in our life. And when we do not look at this manual, when we do not look at the word of God and live our everyday life without consulting God's word and God's community, it can be a disaster in our life. 
January 28, 1986. The world was reeling under the shock and horror as 73 seconds after taking off, the space shuttle Challenger burst into flames, resulting in one of the worst space disasters in history. Seven crew members, aced six astronauts, and a civilian teacher died. A later investigation of the disaster concluded that the reason the Challenger exploded was because of a small failure of a rubber O-ring or a washer in cold weather conditions. Apparently, the O-ring manufacturer had warned NASA that the O-ring would not function optimally in cold temp temperature conditions. It needed at least 50 degrees centigrade for a safe launch. That day of the launch, it was only 18 degrees. And NASA ignored the manufacturer's specifications, overruled the warnings, and voted to launch. Disaster. Everybody died. Loss of property, loss of lives. Why? Ignored the manufacturer's manual. We have a greater manual for life in the word of God. And when we go just against the word of God, we do not have time to spend in the presence of God. We are so busy and caught up with the things of the world and not time for God. It is heading us straight for disaster. Not seeking after the Lord. Are we seeking? Are we watching? Are we listening to God? And are we seeking after God in his word on a day-to-day -day basis? That's a question this text is asking us. So on the first part, we saw a leader who does not want to see. The second one, write down. Here is a lad who wants to see. Lad is a boy. Okay, who wants to see. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9, Eli told Samuel, go and lie down and if he calls you, say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Verse 10, the Lord came and stood there. Can you see the visitation for a lad who is seeking to see, who wants to see? The Lord came. When the vision was rare, the word of God was not penetrating in the world at large. Here is a small boy where the Lord comes and appears. The Lord came and stood there calling us at the other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. He does not want to speak anything to God. If God comes and appears to us one day morning when you're praying, would you talk or would you allow the Lord to talk? It is the Lord who has come and appeared to Samuel. He would have had many things to talk to God. Yes, he's been praying. But look at Samuel. He doesn't want to talk. He wants to hear from God. He's seeking after God. He wants to hear what the Lord has to speak to him. The only speech that is reported direct from Samuel is, Here I am. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This should be our prayer. Here I am. When I take the Bible on the mornings or in the nights and meditate on the word of God, I do not go to see what I can benefit from, but I will say, Lord, here I am. Speak, for your servant is listening. And that was Samuel. God speaks and we listen. And then what did God speak? God spoke about the disaster that is about to come to Eli's household. In chapter 3 verse 17 onwards, come read verse 17. Morning, he laid there until the morning and morning Eli came to Samuel. And what was it that he said to you? Eli asked, verse 17. Do not hide it from me. Here is such a pathetic situation. A man whom God was speaking to is coming to a young lad to listen from God. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Right? So he told everything what he heard from God to Eli. 
Come down to verse 19 onwards. That's how this chapter ends. Chapter 3, verse 19 onwards. Look at what happened to Samuel. One who was seeking after God. What happened? The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Silo and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Look at that great revelation of God towards Samuel. What does that tell us? The Lord, third point, the Lord will reveal himself to be seen. If there is a lad, if there is a boy and a girl, a man and a woman, willing to go near the presence of God, willing to hear God, willing to let God minister to him or her, the Lord is willing to reveal himself to be seen by his people. Okay? What happened to Samuel because he was willing to listen from God? The Lord was with him. Look at the benefits. What happened to Eli? But what happened to Samuel? The Lord was with him. The Lord appeared to him. He saw an uh, appearance of the Lord. In First and Second Samuel, this is one of the greatest appearances of God. You don't find such appearances in this book at any time. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Through his word, God revealed himself. And look at the next thing, what happened in the land. All Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Where is Dan? The Danites were staying somewhere south of the promised land. But later, they migrated and started staying on the top of the north of the promised land. And where is Beersheba? Beersheba is where? Down. So the Bible says, the narrator says, just because one man listened to God and was willing to obey God, all the people of the promised land, right from north, Dan to Beersheba, everybody recognized Samuel was a prophet of the Lord. The recognition came from the Lord. Amen? When you see the Lord, what happens? Come to chapters 4 and this verse 1. Samuel's word came to all Israel. From now onwards, from chapter 4 onwards, Eli is gone and it is Samuel's words, not anybody's words. Come little before to 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel and he grew up. He let none of Samuel's word fall to the ground. And in chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Samuel's word came to all of Israel. In a boy who sought the Lord... Finally, God's word became his word. And by the time you come to chapter 4, his words became God's words. There was no conflict between his words and God's words. See that progression of Samuel as a priest, as a prophet of Israel. He never knew how to listen to the Lord. He had no direction, but he was having a willing heart. Probably Eli did not even lead him to that direction to listen from God. But he had a discerning heart. He stayed close to the presence of God. His eyes were open. ears were attentive. And when God spoke, he heard. He was obedient. And slowly God used him. People recognized him. Not because of he wanted to promote himself. But people recognized the anointing on him as a prophet all through the land. And his words became God's words. And God's words became his word. And Samuel becomes the light of the world in his generation. Let me conclude. On the night of April 14, 1912, the ocean liner Lyland from California had progressed 1,500 miles to her destination near Boston Harbor. An immense field of oceanic ice had halted its progress and the liner had reversed engines, parked as a precautionary measure, closed the lights and everybody went to sleep because there is ice in front. It was midnight and the second officer of the ship, Herbert Stone, was alone at the bridge, glancing over the waters and he noticed a white flash go up. He closely looked at it. 
he ran as close as he can from his ship three more flashes and the flashes never came he went and woke up the captain who was sleeping and the captain came and said maybe that's somebody is looking for help and they took their torch lights the ship lights and they flashed it over the ocean they did not find any ship in the vicinity early morning they realized that this flashes were coming from the titanic who was just 9 miles away flashing for help the survivors in the titanic titanic had not just sent flashes of lightning but the titanic had also sent radio signals of sos to the nearby ships what happened on that day in california lyland the radio operators called off the day switched off the radio signals they went to sleep their ears were not tuned to the frequency and the end result is disaster dear friends if you and i have to listen to fm radio we have to tune into that frequency and when you tune into that frequency you hear the voice from the other side god is constantly speaking he is speaking primarily through his son jesus in this present day and through his revealed word of god and if we tune our ears and seek to seek the lord we will hear from him and we can be purposeful god will use us like a light in this generation for, like a samuel for the glory of god's name amen i just want to close by reading john chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 jesus is the light in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it you may be a child of god but he wants to reveal himself to you do you really know the lord do you really hear from him do you really seek him where are you sleeping where are your day to day lives are you near the presence of god or are you away from the presence of god are you able to decipher the voice of god in your day to day life do you go to the word of god on a daily basis and just tell god speak lord your servant is listening and if you have no time for god and his word and to hear from god make a commitment right now god is willing to be revealed he wants to reveal the plans and the purposes of your life he has a word for you right in the situation that you're going through in your discouragement in your crossroads of life God has not left you abandoned you. God has a word for you through Jesus and his word right now. Let's make a decision. Lord, I want to come to your presence daily meditating on the word of God. And when you open your Bible, let it be your prayer. Lord speak for your servant is listening. Lord speak for your servant is listening.